What's up, cover girls? You're probably wondering, is the Hasselblad X-Pan worth it? I don't know. You may love or hate my answer so much that you punch your computer screen. Today's episode is sponsored by Squarespace. Hey. Hey. I'm sure you have a wealth of free time to answer questions like these, so here goes. I've always wanted a Leica M6, but after watching your channel, I'm really looking into the Hasselblad X-Pan slash Fuji TX1. That being said, I'm a little reluctant to drop nearly $5,000 or more on eBay, but it looks like the options to find one of these cameras elsewhere is fairly slim. I'm also a little worried about the electronics aspect of the X-Pan that may go out and repairs would be difficult or expensive. So I get this question a lot, and my answer was always, duh it's worth it panoramic images are tight and the camera itself is how do i put this delicately it's quite f***able however with the ongoing boom of interest in film photography and the prices for everything skyrocketing i recently had to reevaluate my position on the x-pan I could sit here and reiterate that the X-Pan and the TX-1 are the exact same camera, collaborated on by Hasselblad and Fuji and released over the turn of the century. They're both 35mm rangefinder cameras and are the only ones of their kind that shoot double the width of a standard 35mm frame, aka panoramic. Of course, they can also shoot standard 35mm, but come on, who the f*** actually buys that camera to do that? That's like some Zodiac killer sh but chances are you probably already know all this information and you're just watching this video for confirmation on whether or not to buy the damn thing. So is the X-Pan slash TX-1 worth it? No, I don't. Not anymore. So herein lies my biggest gripe with this babe magnet. It's electronic. Everything is pretty much automated on this camera, and while that was cool and futuristic in 1998, it's ultimately going to lead to this camera's demise. Electronic parts are known to die over time. From what I hear, they usually last about 40 years or so, but there's always outliers. What happens when they do eventually bite the dust on this camera? Well, you're pretty much f***ed. Hasselblad and Fuji, though I love them, don't give a flaming fart about these cameras anymore, and because of that, they don't make replacement parts for them, or service them from what I hear. So when your X-Pan sh**s the bed in your greatest hour of need, that's it. That's all you get. Unless you buy another body and cannibalize the parts. When that dark day comes for my own TX-1, I plan to cope with the issue by pretending it still works. It, in fact, being a lifeless husk of Panoramic's past will be my little secret. I mean, it's either that or a total emotional breakdown where I end up naked, so... If you know that eventually one day this camera will die, using it will give you many heart palpitations. I was recently loading some Kodak Ektachrome slight duplicating film, and when I closed the film door, the auto wind on the camera didn't do the literal only thing it was designed to do, auto wind my film. So I started thinking, well, that's it. It wasn't a good run, but I knew this day would come. Time to start making preparations for this camera's Viking funeral. But guess what? Turns out the camera just has some dumbass quirks and it isn't flammable. Aside from the version 1 not being able to do exposures longer than 30 seconds without overheating, turns out that there are also some weird ISO rules. Because there was no DX code on the slide duplicating film, I had to set the ISO on the camera to a certain number before loading. I think it was 100 ISO, but I can't really remember. Once I did that, it wound just fine. I have the manual for the TX-1, maybe I should just read it sometime. Ah, fuck. Anyway, long story short, that was the day that my mom saw her grown up 30 year old son shit his pants before her very eyes. Okay, so for the sheer price of these alone, I really don't think it's worth it to own one of these anymore. Especially because I just told you that they are basically ticking time bombs, like that lump on my ass. I don't know if you've looked up prices on these bad boys lately, but it's not so chill. In fact, as I recently scrolled through eBay, I had to take a Tums. Averaging about $5,000 for both the body and lens combo, I think that that is far too much to pay for this camera. About two years ago, I picked up the TX-1 body for about $2,000, and I picked up the 45mm lens for just under a grand, which I still felt was pretty high at the time. Why are these cameras so damn expensive? Well, as I said before, they're the only ones of their kind, and they aren't being made anymore. But just you wait, $5,000 is the base price. There's always an opportunity to spend more money with this camera. Turns out that there are three lenses for this system. As I mentioned before, I have the 45mm, and there's also the 90mm, which is actually slightly cheaper, but that's where the savings end. There's also the 30mm lens, which is apparently made of diamonds or something, because it goes for about four dollars to $5,000 alone. Pretty much the same price as a coffin. I don't know. Might just be easier to die. I have actually shot with the 30mm before, thanks to Phil over at the darkroom. And it's an amazing lens, I'll give it that. But still, like, damn. But wait, 
there's even more. These lenses are good, but they're not quite perfect out of the box, or presumably gold horse-drawn chariot that they arrive in. They have heavy vignetting in panoramic mode. I don't know about the 90 because I've never used it, but the 45 and the 30 definitely have it. Luckily, there is a solution. You can buy a center filter for these lenses, which will set you back another 500 clams. So, if you're like me and think spending $500 on a lens filter is absurd, then, I don't know, I guess you can go to therapy about it which might be cheaper. What's worse though is that those filters will take your already slow X-Pan lenses and make them slower. The 45 and the 90 can only go down to F4, and with the sender filter applied, you're losing about a stop of light, so that ain't good. The 30 millimeter, which definitely needs the filter, can only go down to 5.6. So with the filter on, you're looking at shooting at an equivalent of F8 at its fastest. And on top of that, literally, you need a special viewfinder for the 30 millimeter. Hey, this is Jason rudely interrupting the flow of the video from the future, or one of many alternate futures, I'm still not sure. For anyone that gives two shits about this, I just want to say that my man Casey pointed out recently that you can actually adapt an old Nikkor shift lens to the X-Pan, and it's a hugely discounted way to shoot a wider focal length. There's actually a really great article about it on 35mm C, but every time I go to that website I inevitably end up buying a new film camera, so I guess you've been warned. Shift lenses produce larger image circles, and this one in particular has been tested and confirmed to cover the X-Pan panoramic format. And even better, it opens up to f2.8. You will however need an adapter to get that shit mounted on the camera, and uh, it won't link the rangefinder, so scale focusing is your only hope. I'm going to test it out myself, um, I just didn't have time to do it in this video because I was busy playing video games and didn't want to get Dorito crust on my TX1. Anyway, back to past Jason who is probably happier, healthier, and handsomer. If infrared film is your thing, you'll have to shell out for the X-Pan 2 or TX2, which are like double the price, so good luck with that. It's exhausting. Not a good situation at all. But that's all there is for compact, true 35mm panoramic. Obviously, panoramic is sexy. It can turn an okay photo into a Pulitzer Prize winning banger, but there are a few things to consider on the output side of your work. Scanning is kind of a pain up the ass. That's right, it's evolved from in the ass to up it. I use DSLR scanning and I end up stitching two images together to create a full resolution image of true panoramic. If you go the stitched route for scanning, there are a few things you have to keep an eye out for, like overlap, constant exposure, yada yada yada, etc etc. If you're getting scans from the lab, that's cool too, but oftentimes they'll charge a little bit extra because it is an unusual format and they have to find some sort of crafty MacGyver style workaround. If you're printing, that's great, your shots will look beautiful. But it's worth mentioning that finding picture frames for panoramic images will be by nature just a little more difficult and harder to find than standard size frames. Furthermore, if Instagram is your final output, then be prepared for it to look sh Daddy Zuck doesn't like wide frames on Instagram and won't display it to the full extent of its format. Usually people just add white borders and or do a carousel, but obviously that kind of sucks. If your website is your final output, I will say that today's sponsor Squarespace actually presents your panoramic images in a nice large display online. Squarespace is an all-in-one website building platform that features all the tools you'll need to build a visually pleasing photography website. I've been using Squarespace to host my own website and portfolio, and to say it's been an absolute breeze would be an understatement. With Squarespace's intuitive user interface and hundreds of professionally designed templates, crafting your own professional or personal website has never been easier. If you're keen to start selling prints, zines, or photo books, there are even modules for that. You can build your own online store, set prices, and manage inventory all from the main dashboard. And if you run into any snags, Squarespace offers 24-7 a award-winning customer support to help get you on your way. So what are you waiting for? If you're ready to build a website, you can start a free trial today at squarespace.com slash grainy days. And if you use the code grainy days at checkout, you can get 10% off your first purchase. So yeah, even though I think that the camera is riddled with issues and not really worth the pesos anymore, I think it's worth highlighting a few things that make the camera awesome. It shoots panoramic. So with all that information now bestowed down upon you as you decide to plunge your precious gold doubloons into the system, do you still want it? There are a lot of positive things to like about this camera. Looking through the viewfinder is gorgeous, the body of the camera is made of titanium, and the lenses for the system render your images with a subtle beauty that is unmatched. But f is that price just way too high for something that will inevitably break out on you? Like I said, probably 600 times. Yeah, I think so. I think that the window of opportunity for most people to reasonably buy one is pretty much closed now, but it's ultimately up to you. If you have wads of cash flowing out your ass and just have to have true 35mm panoramic, then get it. Or just shoot medium format and get a 35mm pano kit. 
Oh yeah, and they used shit paint on the Hasselblad versions of this camera, so if you want something clean and pristine, get the Fuji version.